All right, so let's just get started here. Um, my name is Tony Hauser. I'm a product manager um, for the geoenrichment service across of ArcGIS. Um, I started out in the business analyst team more than 10 years at Esri. Um, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Dan Stonning. Uh, he is a product engineer, works with the geoenrichment and the business analyst team. Um, the geoenrichment service is born out of the business analyst a family of products. Uh, it was the uh, web-based GIS implementation of what we did in business uh, desktop for many years, and that's supporting getting additional location-based context uh, based on area with attributes such as uh, demographics, uh, total households, consumer behaviors, business summaries, and other related data, data about in the business sales world about markets, but over the years we've realized that the geoenrichment service goes way beyond that. It has applicability to all kinds of use cases, uh, government use cases, nonprofit and uh, um, uh, uh, not-for-profit uh, use cases, and uh, lots of use cases in in healthcare. So, in a nutshell. Geoenrichment describes the action of enhancing existing data with additional location-based context. This context can drive better understanding, analysis, and ultimately better decisions based on the, the information and the decision support that it provides. Um, more recently, and, and I'm sure all of you have seen this trend, this is a way to get information about place and location, and we'll talk about what types of places you can get information about a little later here. But in, in this era of uh, growing interest in data science, analytics, and those types of insights, machine learning, AI, sometimes that association with place is the only thing that the data is related to by that location. What I mean by that is that some of the the more obvious connections with location-based context may only be exposed based on like a store sales, same store sales, or number of uh, beds in, in a hotel room, et cetera. But sometimes that spatial relationship that it's located within the area or near an area is that additional insight, that additional context that you can feed into all of, the, all of these trends with machine learning and AI and ultimately create a model and do some predictive analytics with a lot of this data. So we're seeing a, a huge interest in a geo enrichment and other ArcGIS location data associated with location for those types of advanced use cases. So Esri's geo enrichment capability provides access to global data describing people, places, and businesses. It also includes uh, global boundaries with flexible output options that you can consume in your apps and solutions, and we'll talk about some of those today, and the ability to analyze your user-defined study areas wherever they may be or however they may be shaped uh, around the world. Um, GeoEnrichment is available to developers through APIs and components, and it's actually consumed across ArcGIS Mostly, many of you are probably familiar with it through the enriched layer capability in ArcGIS Pro or the online web map viewer. It's also available in several workflows and tools within Business Analyst, within the Business Analyst widget with Experience Builder, and, and much more. So let me just take a couple, probably a minute or two to talk about some of the use cases here. When it started out in business analysts, this ability to get information about a location it was mostly associated with market analytics, like site selection, trade or service area analysis, getting summaries of businesses like for the competition or complementary businesses, and determining based on the demographics of an area, consumer uh, to profile consumers 
find out who your best customers are and why, or make, make predictions on why your source store sales are very successful in the area based on the local demographics, and then maybe look for more areas. But we're seeing growth in other uh, types of app, uh, applications, like predictive analytics or prescriptive analytics, and, and much more you can see there. All right, so um, I just ran through some introductory slides about geo-enrichment, but I'm going to pass it on to my colleague, Dan, who's going to give you some live demos so you can see it in action, and then we'll dive a little deeper. Thank you, Tony. So Tony described the, the act of enriching something as in enhancing your existing data with, with the data from the geo-enrichment service. And there are some well-defined uh, tools that are out of the box that can um, help you with that. So what I'm going to show, just kind of in the most basic use case, is what this looks like uh, with the Enrich Layer tool in the Map Viewer before we get into some of the developer resources. Um, if I do a search for Palm Springs here, it'll drop a point on the map for us, and I can add that point to a new sketch layer. And then I can open the analysis tools. And in this enrich data category, we have the enrich layer tool. Has anyone used this tool before? Good. So this is new for everyone. Um, we're going to plug in our sketch layer. And then we're going to build some kind of a buffer around this point. So we have some options for our buffer type. Line distance would be a standard ring buffer. Um, we also have options for travel modes like uh, drive times and walking times. So let's go ahead and do a drive time. And we'll do a value of five uh, minutes around our, our point there. And then I'm going to select the data we want to enrich with. And this component that we're looking at here is called the data browser. This, uh, this data browser lives throughout the ArcGIS uh, ecosystem in, in many different apps and uh, resource pages. Um, I'll show what it looks like in some other uh, places a bit later in the demo. Um, but for now, let's take a look at some of the variables that are available to us here. There, I think Tony mentioned there are over 13,000 variables to choose from, right? And so if we drill down into some of these categories, like spending, for example, and we show all the spending variables here, you, you would be really surprised at how much uh, granularity and, and detail some of these variables cover. So spending on uh, food and beverages, dining out, spending on uh, food at home, uh, spending on health care, um, household goods and services, um, spending on travel, uh, apparel, and I, there's variables even for uh, <clears throat> like pet food and how many people own pets. And so I would really encourage you to, to um, after the session, just poke around in the data browser and, and, and just see how many, uh, how many variables there are. Um, what I'll do for now is in the income category, I'll select these top three income variables. We, within each category, we have um, kind of a list of the most popular variables before you drill down into all the subcategories. And I'll go ahead and select these for uh, median net worth, disposable income, and household income. And I'm going to choose to show my uh, drive time on the map. And then we just need to give this one a name. So I'll call it Dev Summit 2024. And go ahead and run this. And while this runs, um, it'll, it'll take about 10 seconds or so. Uh, the, this uh, analysis tool, it's basically um, sending a request to the enrichment service, getting that response back, and then it's going to generate an output feature layer. And that feature layer will have an associated attribute table. And what we can then do uh, when this finishes running, we can uh, click on our area on the map and open up the pop-up and see what attributes are um, associated with that area. And it usually doesn't take this long. <laughs> yeah. Um, the curse of a live demo. <laughs> it takes a little longer when we're generating a drive time as opposed to a ring because it has to connect to the routing services to build uh, the, the drive time service area. Um, 
but yeah, I guess on the shared uh, internet here at the convention center, it's, it's running a bit slower today. There we go. There we go. So that'll draw on the map. Zoom in a bit closer. Here's our drive time area. I'll open up the pop-up. And these are the three variables that I selected to append to the output. So that's kind of the most basic use case, dropping a point on the map, building some kind of a buffer around it, and then getting some information for that area. Um, you, could, you could have your own data here. You could have your own layer of uh, counties or postal codes that you um, already have data for. And you can just enhance that data by appending some of these enrichment attributes to your, uh, to your existing layer. So that's kind of a really easy way to demonstrate um, what the act of, of data enrichment is um, using uh, an out-of-the-box tool. Um, and we'll, we'll hand it back to Tony for now, um, and then we'll get uh, the next part of the demo coming up will be more on the developer resources. Great. And then everybody, remember how, how sophisticated or complicated that, that drive time, that service area polygon was. And, and just uh, hold that in your head because we actually, that, that's one of the, the benefits of the geo-enrichment service that you'll see in um, a subsequent slide when we talk about it here. So let's talk about the data real quick, what you can access. There's a QR code on the top. I'm not, I think it's big enough for some of you uh, in the audience to capture here, but that'll um, take you to our uh, location data uh, pages. Um, one of the things that we do here is, uh, Dan mentioned that we have more than 10,000 variables and- 13,000. More than 13,000, yep. And we have data worldwide. It's not just for the United States. And um, we have demographic data which describes over 90% of the world's population. And we call all of this Esri location data. And we source it from multiple providers and suppliers and sources, including Esri itself. Many of you don't, uh, may not know this, but we, Esri has their own demographic uh, data development team. We have our own data scientists on staff. We have data engineers on staff that work with all this data. We have uh, contracts and legal folks. Uh, we got business management folks that go through all the, 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 the the supplier relationships and the contracting and all that. If you were to try to source and license all this data yourself, it, it, you would have to have a dedicated team. And we, uh, the benefit of accessing this data, Esri's location data through our uh, products like the Geo Enrichment Services, you don't have to worry about that. You don't have to worry about maintaining it. You don't have to worry about updating it. You don't have to worry about licensing it. So. We have data for more than 170 countries and regions around the world, and we have a baseline set of demographics and socioeconomic data and some business data that we call standard demographics, and you'll see that on, on the, the web page that the QR code is pointing to. It, it provides a broad picture of the topics and comes with, from a consistent data source and a set of met, uh, methodologies from the source, including the, uh, the, the processes that we uh, take take the data. We don't simply redistribute our data from our suppliers and sources. We actually manipulate it, process it, QA it, publish it, and go through that entire release process. Many of our data variables are uh, standardized across uh, many regions and are updated on a rolling basis throughout the year. Um, depending on region, data is updated every, uh, our global data is updated every one or two years on a rolling basis, sometimes country by country, sometimes by data set. And then we have some advanced demographics. I would say you can see the countries there that we currently support with our advanced uh, demographics. If you saw this presentation last year, you would note that we've added a few extra countries and, and territories there. These are more detailed, more granular, uh, data sets and, and boundaries. Uh, and when I say boundaries, I'm talking about administrative boundaries, census or enumeration-based boundaries, postal code boundaries, those, those type of well-known boundaries that a certain data are aggregated in or you may want to analyze um, through the geo-enrichment service and all the capabilities it supports. 
So users can perform more detailed analysis of an area of interest within uh, these countries or regions with these additional uh, advanced demographics. Within the US, which um, we have the uh, most uh, attributes available today, um, we support the demographic needs uh, through uh, various sources of suppliers and through our in-house uh, demographers and statisticians who develop annual updates, which include current year and five-year estimates, uh, current year estimates and five-year projections. Um, ESRI Demographics is a collection of demographic, economic, socio and economic spending, behavioral, and business data at multiple levels of geography, all the way down to the census block group level in the US. And for reference, the census block group level generally has about 1,500 people or 600 households on average. And we have data about people. Uh, and I, as I said, we have current year and five year uh, forecasts of key demographic and socioeconomic measures. And uh, this includes census and ACS-based data. But again, we, we provide current year and five-year estimates in between uh, the decennial census um, uh, data that, are, that the US federal government provides. And we have data on uh, preferences, and these are behaviors to understand people's uh, consumer behaviors, like spending habits, characteristics associated with what types of residential markets they live in, um, education uh, levels, the neighborhoods that they live in, et cetera. Um, and uh, with, them, with our market potential data set, we estimate the likely demand for products, services, and behaviors in uh, areas with consumer spending. We estimate annual spending by households on various products and services. And finally, we have data about places. So. Um, this is a business summaries by uh, industry classifications such as uh, NAICS codes or North American Industry Classification System or SIC codes, Standard Industry Classification System. So we have summaries of all restaurants or all grocery stores, all those types of categories. We also have uh, crime data in our US demographics. It's the, it's the likelihood of certain time, uh, types of crime that may occur. All right, so if there's any kind of takeaway for you first timers uh, here um, it, that we want to communicate to you so you would understand why geo-enrichment is beneficial to use, it's associated with the way we apportion data or make estimates of the data. So I have here, let's say this is a map. And uh, I have four areas defined, one, two, three, and four. It's a kind of a quadrant. And let's say that there is spending data associated with each of those four areas. They may represent postal code areas. And it's only aggregated to that postal code area. So what if I wanted to analyze a potential location, in this case for a grocery store, within the center of that red ring-based analysis area. You can see that that ring-based area or more complicated areas like Dan showed you earlier based on drive time or, or drive distance or walking distance, et cetera, don't necessarily match the size and shape and the area of the, the data that it, it is querying under the hood. Now, most folks would say, okay, that ring is touching those four areas, so simply summarize the, the predicted spending or the current spending on groceries within those four areas. But the problem is my area of interest doesn't really match uh, or capture the populations uniformly across those four areas. So what geo-enrichment does is it applies a demographic weight. It, it determines what percentage of the population and households it captures in sub-seconds using spatial analysis and our global population modeling, and then applies a weight to the query and returns a more reliable estimate. 
And with that more reliable estimate, you're able to get a better idea of what's really happening on the ground. So you can see that in that postal code area two on the top right, we're capturing the majority of the population in that depiction based on that very dense urban area captured in the, in the northeast corner there. However, in the postal code area four, which is the, the, on the southeast there, I'm capturing a big percentage of the area there, but most of the population, according to the depiction, is outside the area. So everything that geoenrichment supports, that includes enriched layers, that includes a reporting, that includes the infographics, is actually doing this at sub-second speeds with lots of data and applying all those weights seamlessly. And it's all powered by our spatial analysis and our global population modeling that our demographers are actually doing. So this not only works in the United States, it, it works, as I said, in 90% of where uh, people live across the world. So um, this, we do have this coverage because we've a, we have a population model that works across the world. It's based on a combination of uh, modeling, image processing, and, uh, and other ancillary data sets with, uh, with some spatial analysis by our data scientists and data engineers. So let's talk about the types of areas that you can analyze with geo-enrichment and, and, and to perform that data enrichment, that reporting, those infographics that you'll see a little later here. We can analyze ring-based, uh, we can analyze areas around address, address, address points or lat long points. And so these, uh, the two on the left, we could create a ring-based area. Uh, we sometimes we call it a buffer area. Or we can do a, a service or a trade area based on a drive time, walk time, or other, some type of uh, other uh, service area. We can also query predefined areas, those well-known geographies. That's why we have a catalog. We support a catalog of global geographies in uh, all of the countries and markets we support at 170 plus countries and regions and many layers of geography, including postal census and administrative based geographies. So you may just wanna, in the US, you may just wanna query a bunch of zip codes and you don't need to be able to draw or find out what those zip codes look like. We actually have the, uh, the polygon geometry for them. And then finally, we have a use case with custom defined, user defined polygons. So this is really useful if your organization has their own proprietary trade areas or service areas that may or may not be a combination of a well-known geography like postal codes. It may just be an arbitrarily drawn polygon on the map. We can analyze those areas accurately due to that uh, demographic apportionment that I explained in the, the previous slide. So what types of output information products can you obtain once you submit those uh, areas of interest within uh, to the geo-enrichment service and all the, the supporting capabilities? You can get these interactive infographics. You can see that community profile report on the right there, or you can see uh, one of uh, Esri Japan's uh, demographic reports on the, the bottom right. You can get pre-formatted reports. We've had these for a very long time. Uh, you could imagine that, let's say a commercial realtor has a bunch of properties in their portfolio and they wanna quickly describe the markets around potential location for a shopping center or store location to their prospective clients who may be looking to lease. And in that case, that Preformatted report there is uh, a report based on uh, data from Mexico uh, from the Inehi data source. And, uh, and then as developers, you can also, instead of having these interactive infographics or preformatted reports, you could consume the data as JSON or other data interchange formats. I would call that like getting access to the tabular data and incorporating it in your own applications and reporting and, and supporting your users that way. You'll see some of that uh, towards the end here. 
And then there's also this, cap this ancillary capability in the Geo Enrichment Service to look up all those geographies. So as I said, you have access to all of that through the Geo Enrichment Service, all those different uh, administrative boundary layers, et cetera. So um, one more slide before I uh, give it back to Dan. Uh, this is a summary of some of the developer options to access the Geo Enrichment Service. Uh, you saw that Dan gave you a uh, um, kind of a intro to uh, um, the Geo Enrichment Service through the experience, the business analyst widget, and um, you're able to create info, info, interactive infographics. These are like da dashboard-based reports over the web. The pre-formatted reports are, can be generated dynamically through uh, Python and the REST API. The, uh, getting the data, all those different, those 13,000 plus uh, attributes describing people, places, and businesses around the world, you can get through the, the REST API, through JavaScript, through Python, as you can see there. And then uh, to look up those various geographies and to access the metadata and even access some of the geometry from all these geographies, uh, you can access through those three things. I'm going to pass it over to Dan now, and he's going to give you some uh, information about the doc. Thank you, Tony. So the, the first part of the demo I showed was the Enrich Layer tool, which is an out-of-the-box tool that exists in the Map Viewer with the analysis tools. So let's, let's take a look now at some of the developer resources. And uh, this mapping APIs and location services and uh, the platform as a service guide, this is really the place to, to come if you're interested in um, doing a deep dive into uh, sending requests directly to the service or, or building custom applications. And what I'll, what I'll show here is on this local data search example, um, if I scroll about halfway down here, I want to show this, this uh, live example. And this is going to look really similar to what I showed in the Enriched Layer tool. You, you drop a point on the map, it's going to build a buffer around that point and return some facts. And um, the APIs that we have examples for in, in this uh, tutorial, you can uh, select on this drop down. We have uh, example code for the ArcGIS Maps SDK for JavaScript, uh, the ArcGIS API for Python, which Tony's going to demo shortly here, uh, along with other APIs such as ArcGIS, REST.js, and uh, Esri Leaflet. Um, now, <clears throat> if we want to take a look at how we, we work directly with the service. If I go to this uh, service overview with the uh, API reference here, it's going to describe um, some of the uh, key uh, concepts here, such as the service URL, the geoenrich.rgs.com domain. This is the service we call to get uh, enrichment data back. And then it's also going to describe some of the uh, key parameters. Um, so if I come down here to required parameters, the only thing we actually have to pass to the service is a study area. So an XY location, for example, you know, dropping a point on the map. And then there are defaults that will be used if you don't specify anything else. The default being a one mile buffer around that point. Um, if you want to uh, use some of the optional parameters, for example, study area options, this is how we, instead of a default one mile ring buffer, we could, we could tell the service that we want a drive time, a network service area with a the travel mode of driving with a five, 10, 15 minute uh, buffer radius around that point. Um, some other optional parameters are data collections and analysis variables. And so when I was showing the data browser, we had that, that experience where you can click on categories of the data and browse around uh, in the Enriched Layer tool. Well, we, we also have that experience here uh, in the developer resources. This data browser um, is also here. We call it the analysis variable finder here. And you can, uh, you can browse around the same kind of uh, experience of clicking on categories and, and seeing um, what variables are associated with each category. And so this is um, kind of how you can start, um, <clears throat> you know, building, a, building uh, your request to the server. And what I want to show is uh, a tool called Postman. So if I come back to the, uh, 
uh, API reference here, and I do a find in this page for Postman. You're going to see this uh, try it in Postman. Has anyone worked with Postman before? A couple people? Great. So we, we have a Postman collection uh, available for the public for our, the ArcGIS location services. And um, there are a couple things to do to get started here. Uh, you, you do need an account, an ArcGIS account, um, and a Postman account. Uh, you do need to fork the environment variables and the collection, and then you need an access token. And you can, you can get your token in a couple of different ways. Uh, there's a generate token resource uh, in ArcGIS.com where you can get a short-lived token that lasts for up to two weeks. Um, but really the recommended uh, way is to get an API key. And if I come uh, to this page over here, this is the developers.arcgis.com root uh, page here. And the first button you'll see is the dashboard. And this dashboard is where you can come to generate your API key. And you can scope your API key to different location services. And you'll see that I have mine scoped here to geo enrichment and the service area service, which allows us to create the drive times. So you take your API key, and once you've uh, forked uh, the workspace and the environment variables, um, you can uh, plug your API key in here under the access token uh, variable, and then you can start using the collection. So if I click on the collections button here, you'll see um, what I've forked for the demographics and geo enrichment API. These are the two main operations I want to talk about, the enrich operation and the create report operation. The enrich operation is kind of what I showed in the analysis tool where we're requesting some variables to be appended to an output. So now if I, um, if I send this request here to the server, I've, I've asked for a data collection called food. And if I scroll down to the response, you can see the, these are some of the variables returned. Um, folks who are spending money on alcoholic beverages at home or uh, at restaurants. Um, other variables like... Uh, Every permutation of alcohol consumption. Right? Yeah, basically. Uh, mm -hmm. Average meals at restaurants, uh, lunch away from home, etc. And these are the aliases of the variables, which are human readable. Uh, this would be the variable ID that's kind of used for the internal system. And then we have these variables, which are more human readable. And if I scroll all the way down to the bottom in this response, you'll see the values for each of these variables. So that's... Um, a quick overview of enrich. These are some of the parameters we used. Uh, the data collections parameter, I haven't mentioned this yet. There is another tool called the data collection finder. Now, if, if an analysis variable is one field, a data collection is a, a group of attributes that have some similar characteristics. And we have this uh, option for exploring the data collections. So if I click on United States, uh, we'll select the year of data we want. Um, this concept of a hierarchy is uh, a vintage of data along with its associated boundaries. And the current year we have is 2023. Uh, we will be updating the US data uh, for the 2024 current year and future year estimates uh, with the June release before you see. Uh, the current data right now is for 2023. And then we can select, uh, or we can browse the data collections here. So um, I had done uh, a request for the food data collection. And um, you can see what variables are here in the food data collection. There are others we could explore, um, for example, commute. So workers who drive alone to work, uh, workers who carpool, uh, et cetera. And so and, and these are kind of like a shortcut to specifying the variables, right? Right, so we're getting back a group of variables that have some similar characteristics instead of individual variables. And so I'll plug commute in here, if I can spell it right. Send that request. And you'll see we, the variables we have now are, you know, workers who commute to work uh, longer than 20 minutes, um, longer than 40 minutes, longer than an hour, and um, so yeah, would encourage you to check out these tools, the data collection finder and the analysis variable finder, another really handy way to explore what data is available.
And then on the, the those Postman examples, did you write those or are they, those are already included? These are already included in the developer uh, platform guide. So what I, what I had done, if I go back uh, to this um, uh, service overview page, if you just do a find in this page for Postman, it's going to have this uh, <clears throat> little note in, a, in a, a link to the Postman collection. So that's, that's where I linked to the... Um, uh, the location services collections, and I, I forked just this um, demographics and uh, uh, geo enrichment API collection. And then that overview is here well for how to get started. Um, so now the other operation I wanted to talk about is the create report operation. And Tony showed on the slide um, what options we have for reports. So if I send this request, asking for the demographic and income profile request. This is, you know, what Tony described is our, our classic reports, our summary reports. The, in, instead of just getting back, um, you know, a JSON response of, of some variables that you can show in a pop-up or append to an output table, we have this nicely formatted PDF re report. Um, and th these classical style reports have been around for a long time. Uh, the, the output format here is typically a PDF, so once once you generate this report, you have that PDF file. You could share that with anyone. You could send that in an email and just attach the file. Um, the other type of report we want to show is the infographics. And these are you know, the, the customizable within the business analyst family of products, but we have a collection of standard infographics. And they have uh, iconography and charts and maps. And these are... Um, these have been around for you know five plus years, but th these are quite popular throughout ArcGIS, and, and we're really trying to um, you know not have these just available in Business Analyst, but through other products yeah. as well. And we'll we'll kind of show where else you can work with infographics after I show how to work in Postman here. Um, what do you need to customize infographics or those classic reports? So. Yeah, we, we have a collection of uh, pre-CAN reports, but to customize them, you, you do need the business analyst family of products to do that. So if you wanted to put your own data or your own logos in these infographics, uh, that's done in business analyst. Or like select your own variables and all of that. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think that's all I want to show in Postman here. Um, what I want to show next is a, a no-code solution for working with infographics uh, in Experience Builder. So within ArcGIS.com, if I go to the app launcher here and I open Experience Builder, I'm going to come over here and hit Create New. And you'll see some, uh, some uh, categories here of uh, templates to start with. If I click on ArcGIS Online, you're going to see a business analyst option here for starter templates. And these are, these are examples that you can kind of preview. Um, so if I click on uh, one of these on the preview button, it's going to show what this example looks like. And two things I want to highlight here are preset mode and workflow mode. This example is in preset mode. And if I hit OK here, what preset mode is, is the, the administrator who built this app um, <clears throat> has predefined what infographic is used and what kind of study area uh, the user has an option for. So if I click on Palm Springs, or if I search for Palm Springs, it's going to, um, it's going to build a buffer, uh, a drive time buffer around my point that's predefined. I, I believe this is a, maybe a five minute drive time buffer. But the, the point I'm trying to make is that the end user doesn't define the study area around the point. It's already predefined, just as the infographic is predefined. So you can, you can click anywhere on the map, really. If I click somewhere in Los Angeles, it's going to build that same uh, style of buffer around the point and then return the information in this infographic. And you'll see that these infographics are interactive. Um, with infographics, you can export to PDF or to HTML. And with dynamic HTML, we can drill down into these panels and interact with the charts click on certain uh, elements in the infographic and get more information. Now, if I go back to the list of um, examples here uh, in the business analyst category, another one I'll look at is the population trends uh, example. 
So we'll click on the preview button here. And this one is in workflow mode. So preset mode and workflow mode. With workflow mode, the, the end user has more um, control over, um, over the infographic they want to see and the areas that they can build. So, th so this one has a layer in the map of uh, counties in the southeast. So now if I click on one of these counties, I have that county selected now, and you can see some basic pop-up information for that. And then we have our button here to generate our population trends uh, infographic. Yeah, um, let's see. There we go. So I, I've selected Bullock County, and I'm going to run our infographic. In this being in workflow mode, I, I have um, some more options here. I can, uh, you know, fit it to the page however I want, and I can export. So I can export this to uh, an image, a PDF, or dynamic HTML. And if I export this to HTML, it's going to download a file to my uh, to my machine, and then I can open this up in the browser. Um, and this is just a file that's on my machine, and I, I maintain all that interactivity with being able to, you know, click on individual panels, and then this file I could share with someone, you know, I could, I could email it to them, or this could be uh, hosted on a web server and embedded in a dashboard. And, and it works offline, too. Yeah, yeah. Yep. works offline, and th this is an example of, of a, a user building a dashboard with, with these infographics. So this uh, COVID-19 impact report uh, dashboard was built by the Census Bureau, and if I drill down here, or if I scroll down, it'll, it'll come to the individual counties, and if we click on Riverside County, where uh, Palm Springs is, um, we can we can view the infographic for this county. Um, and I believe the Census Bureau, during the height of the pandemic, was updating these infographics daily, and um, <clears throat> You know, host, hosting this in a, in a public-facing uh, application where people could find information about their county. Um, I think that's all I wanted to show for for the rest of my demo. So, Tony, we can turn it back to you. All right. Thanks. And it, very interesting. We we leverage a lot of the U.S. Census Bureau's data in in geo enrichment, but in this case, they're using their own data through our technology um, and to disseminate their information more efficiently uh, to the population, which was very nice uh, story. Um, okay, so um, uh, uh, we're going to talk about, we're, we're just going to go really quickly through an ArcGIS API for Python uh, example here. Um, so let me stop showing. Okay. All right. So I am going to share all of this with you guys. Um, Hopefully, I can upload it with the slides af after. But I, I think uh, the, our event marketing team will uh, help you get this to get this Jupyter notebook to all of you. Obviously, I'm not going to bake my credentials in it, but um, I'll go through it really quickly. It's very nice to tell a story with it. So I, I simply logged on uh, to, and I'm using the the geo enrichment uh, uh, module uh, in the ArcGIS API for. Uh, uh, for Python, and I, I logged in uh, with my uh, um, Esri credentials. You saw that, um, and now I'm going to create a uh, a point based on a lat long. And you saw that Dan uh, talked about the data collection uh, finder earlier. Um, in this case, um, I looked up a data collection that I want to enrich around this uh, a ring, this five mile ring around this point area. I'm not going to go to the uh, data collection finder because uh, Dan already showed that to you, but I'm going to enrich this, this ring-based area with the age data collection. So I'm just going to simply uh, run that step. And uh, you can see that the, uh, the, we got the, all of the uh, different age collection variables, there's several of them. That's why they have that dot, dot, dot abbreviated thing. And uh, enrich this spatially enabled Python uh, data frame because I, I specified return geometry is true. So actually, that ring-based area is described 
at the shape with geometry. So let's create a, a really quick map within Jupyter Notebooks and that spatially enabled data frame that was returned by the GeoEnrichment Service will quickly um, draw that area. And without really doing much other than adding the layer, um, it's already got the, uh, the attributes baked into the, the, the layer here. So you can see the, the, these um, age breaks and the, the, the number of uh, adults um, are, are provided here for the male, male and female populations. You could imagine that the way we visualize this typically in our reports is through a histogram showing the, uh, the, the, the male and female populations. All right, so on the next one, okay, I'm just repeating that one again. In this next example, we're going to uh, enrich the standard geography feature. So those are those named geographies like the census areas, those uh, well-known geographies, those enumeration areas, those postal code areas. This time, I got the, I'm using individual variables. So instead of that data collection that Dan talked about, I'm, I'm, I'm specifying individual variables like total population, total households, et cetera. And I got those IDs from that. I can look up the IDs dynamically uh, with the service, but I can also use the tools within the documentation because you can see on the bottom right here, there's copy to CSV or copy to JSON and then simply uh, uh, cut and paste the, the variable IDs here um, into my enrichment variables. In this case, I've, I've chosen the study area of uh, the state of California. Okay, and it quickly enriched that. And you can see here, uh, total population, total households. And again, I requested that the geometry get returned. So this is a spatially enabled uh, uh, data frame. I'll create my second map and add that layer. And then if I zoom in, there it is, geometry and all. And that was very easy, just a few lines of code, and you don't have to worry about uh, getting those boundaries and stuff like that because the GeoEnrichment Service already has access to all of that data, but they also give you access, which gives you a lot of flexibility um, with the different applications and solutions you might be supporting. All right, so now I just wanted to, I mentioned earlier that you have access to dynamically querying the, the data collections and the, the attributes that are available. This is just an example, just a few, uh, a handful of records from the, the large collection of uh, demographic variables and data collections that you support. This is actually how that, of uh, those online uh, developer doc resources are powered behind the scenes by uh, these, uh, these functions that are supported by the API. So uh, going down, we're going to work with some uh, uh, open data. This is truly open data from uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. They have a open API that describes a lot of their um, the assistance programs, including their individuals and households program. So um, there is a, no authentication needed, and it is anonymized. Uh, uh, public data that's accessible by all. So it's, a, it's great for uh, uh, working within demonstrations and for studies and for research and academic purposes. So I, I am accessing the Individuals and Households Program and I am pulling data describing uh, 2023 um, uh, disaster declarations across the U.S. So this is a uh, sample, a screenshot of a single JSON record from this API. And I'm going to request the fields in that bluish green color, the disaster number, the state, the, the type of incident, and, and, and then we have these uh, IDs. FIPS stands for Federal Information Processing Standard, and we support that uh, when uh, looking up different types of geographies in the United States. And I'm also, uh, in this case, 
a combination of the state code and the county code gives the full FIPS code for uh, this uh, county area. And then I'm only looking for 2023 data, so from January to December of last year. And I am not studying any tribal lands at this time for, for the, the purposes of this uh, demonstration. So if we continue down here, you can see that I have the, the URL to call FEMA with, those, uh, with the attributes that I described above selected and then filtering. And sorry for this uh, gobbledygook, this is a URL encoded uh, parameters for the filter. And I'm returning the, the, the information back in JSON format. It'll read the re uh, records and put it in a pandas data frame. Okay, that was really quick. And there's uh, 1,320 uh, disaster declarations. These are by county and by state. And uh, you can, uh, it's loaded into uh, Jupyter Notebooks. So let me go ahead and summarize those incidents so you can get a little bit of a visual from it. And uh, these are the different types of incident types and, um, for each of the states and, and the counts. Now, if we look at a, a stacked bar chart at the bottom, you can see that uh, Florida actually had the most incidents in 2023 with a combination of hurricane incident types and uh, tropical storm incidents. And coming in at a close second last year was California with a lot of flood uh, disaster declarations and some severe storm declarations. Now, uh, one of the cool things about uh, geo-enrichment is the ability to actually bring that location-based context so you get additional insights. Well, this is a very simple example. I didn't go uh, crazy with enriching with all types of explanatory variables and stuff like that. You could imagine the different use cases here, like how much assistance is each state or county getting based on their population size, et cetera, et cetera. There's all, this is just a very simple example to communicate that exam, example, that, that concept of modeling with this additional location-based context. But let me go ahead and um, enrich a layer of all the states which had the uh, disaster declarations. And you can see that happened in seconds. And I added, in this case, uh, uh, total number of households and the uh, average household spending um, for, for these states. So you can see these are enormous numbers. But you can also see we got all the geometry back. So we can do some thematic mapping. We can create a color-coded or the, our GIS friends call a choropleth map with that data. And now um, we're going to go ahead, and since what we're going to do here is we're going to create a calculated variable so we can do some comparison. What are the number of incidents per half a million households? Because there are uh, not too many of these incidents and the populations are large. So we've calculated something that makes these comparable. And uh, you can see right here, so that's 65, let's see what that state is. Okay, Vermont, I believe they had some uh, severe weather last year, but comparatively speaking versus the, the how many households are in the state, they had a lot of uh, um, disaster declarations. I believe that was associated with uh, severe weather last year. I have some friends uh, from Vermont. And, and that was a relative measure uh, based on, so this is an example of taking data from, a, in this case, the a FEMA's open data, enriching it, and then uh, creating a derived attribute or variable. I didn't do some crazy modeling or anything like that, but that's certainly possible with the tools that uh, Esri supports. All right, and uh, this last part is I'm gonna actually try to visualize the data on the map. 
because we got all those uh, polygons and stuff like that. All right, this is using a uh, natural breaks classifier. It's, it's the incidence per 500 household, and there is a color ramp, and it's uh, attaching it to this map widget, but I don't see it showing up. So since we're running out of time here and I want to be able to take some messages, let me just pass this right now. Okay, in this last example, it's possible with the geo-enrichment service to just simply query geographies, like I mentioned earlier. In this case, I'm going to specify, remember those uh, FIPS codes, those Federal Information Processing Standard codes that represented a state ID and the county ID. So these are real, um, well-known IDs to describe counties. I just picked out three counties with a single line of code, specified the, uh, the spatial reference or the projection, ask for the geometry back, and I actually want it generalized because I don't need a super, super detailed boundary for a national level map. And with that one line of code, I'll be able to actually plot those boundaries. Uh, let me see. Okay. I don't know why I had that last piece of code in there. Let's try this again. Okay, there we are. So there's three boundaries. Here's it's a, it's a county in Washington State, a county in Rhode Island, and a county in by New Orleans and Louisiana. All with this uh, one line of code and just specifying these IDs. So it's not only possible to query and generate reports and infographics using these IDs. I can also uh, query the boundaries as well. All right, so that was a, um, again, I'm going to do my best to get this out to you guys as soon as possible so you can play with it. Um, all you really need is the, uh, your credentials, and you can sign up for a free uh, developer account if you don't already have them to access uh, um, uh, the location platform. And uh, it comes with uh, some free queries here. So let's um, close by... Um, a last few set of slides, just a couple more slides. Okay, so um, uh, capture this QR code. If, uh, there is a wonderful blog that our colleague Brooke has uh, uh, just released in the last week or two describing uh, the what's new in our February uh, demographic data release, including uh, traffic and crime data for the U.S. and a lot of global data updates. That web map you see there um, is actually a 3D map in, in ArcGIS Pro that's showing uh, one of the crime data variables in the new data set, the uh, motor vehicle theft index. So it's a relative measure of motor vehicle thefts aggregated by hex bin based area. Um, uh, and I forget what the looks like. Yep, I think it's around Denver. Um, and, and you can see that enrichment's able to take those custom hex bin areas and enrich them, and in this case, create a 3D uh, thematic map. All right, so this is the last slide. Um, if we don't get back to you with, uh, for example, that, um, that Jupyter notebook, then uh, you have permission to email me and ask for it, and, you get, and Dan can help you with any uh, technical questions. And if you scan that, you'll get a link to that doc and other resources that uh, Dan showed earlier. So I'd say that's about it. If there's any uh, questions from the audience, we can take them now. All right. Well, we, we certainly we, we appreciate right you the, guys. Right to the 11 o'clock hour. So yes, yeah. thanks, we, everyone, for coming on Friday morning. Yeah, appreciate it. We really appreciate it. Um, and uh, please, please uh, think about all your use cases uh, for that data and all of these analysis capabilities. <laughs> think about how this additional data can be leveraged alongside your other data or even other third-party sources for um, a more advanced insights uh, into things. Um, 
we've, we've really seen an uptick in interest over the years, especially in the last couple of years with the data. We're very excited about it. There's a lot of um, momentum uh, behind the, the Esri location data and geo-enrichment today. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.